Hi, I'm Josh Cadillac, and welcome to my podcast, Know Your Shit. I've been blessed to see great success, as well as seeing the bottom up close and personal in 2008. And if there's one lesson I've learned is that if you want to have success and differentiate yourself from everyone else out there, you need to know your shit. As a successful real estate and crypto investor and an educator, it drives me insane that people do not immerse themselves in their craft. Everyone is so busy advertising and testing new sales techniques, they forget the most important thing, the product. Here I wanna to talk to the folks that got this right. The most successful people in the world in every industry, bring them to you and find out what they learned in their business that made it great. When you're listening to my podcast, you will know for sure that the topics and experts we have on have one thing in common. They know their shit. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Know Your Shit podcast, where our knowledge and pride in what we do drives us to be excellent. My name is Josh Cadenlock, and I'll be in the driver's seat for today's show as we strive to learn how to stop doing deals and start closing customers for life. We have a great show for you today, and actually, we have a special guest who touches on, especially when it comes to real estate, a very important part of the business. This is my business partner, Mr. Cody Lamparello, who's joining us here to talk about the construction side of the business. Cody, I know you're a busy guy, man. Thank you for making time. No problem. I am glad to be here. Glad to get to take part in uh, in this and, and chat a little bit about construction and what's going on right now. So. All right. So I, a lot of real estate agents, as you know, I know you've been around the industry, uh, kind of on the periphery, if you will, also as an investor involved, right? Um, a lot of a lot of agents are are always interested in construction, the idea of flipping homes and what's going on out there. And one of the big mysteries seems to be why there's not more single family home construction going on. It, it, it it's almost seems like they're building maybe rental units, but not not single family homes, yet there's this tremendous demand for single family homes. Do you think it's because of the, the, the timelines and the cost to borrow money that that's what's causing this lack of inventory coming in? I mean, maybe right now, I think that that's, that, that's part of the issue, but in general, at least in, in our location, I think one of the big reasons for the lack of inventory is, is just the cost to build in association with, you know, what land is available. Right. Sure. So anywhere where you have big track land available or there can, you can build a ton of homes, that's all bought by builders. Right. So if someone wants to, so when people want to build something, they're looking at it going, okay, what, well, you know, the, 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 the person that's looking to build, say a, you know, like a three bedroom home, right. It's just going to mm -hmm. cost them too much to do it versus going and just buying their own three bedroom, buying a three bedroom home and remodeling it. Right. The most between finding the land and if you to find the land in an area that you want to get into, they got to, you know, then you, they're, you're demoing out the house or whatever needs to be done. So, and people don't want to sell it. You go and you buy a house for $350,000 to demo it out. So you can put $500,000 into building your three bedroom house. It's hard, right. To find that sort of a piece uh, as a, as a residential, like home buyer, I would think, you know? Right. And so, Another piece of this that seems to be adding costs and making it expensive, because even the big builders don't seem to be bringing a lot of single family home product out of the ground. And the the the, the two pieces that I looked to, and I kind of referenced this already before, is that, especially when it comes to real estate agents, they tend to think that when interest rates go up, it only affects them in real estate because the whole world revolves around real estate, right? That's That's kind of the mindset of the real estate agent a lot of times. But as it turns out, builders borrow a lot of money to take and do their construction. So the construction that they're looking to do has become more expensive in the process of these interest rates going up. And the other piece of it that is that I think, and you can you can maybe speak to this better than I can, is the fact that the timelines for acquiring materials is so up in the air um, that what that does when you add in the idea of carry costs if I have to take and borrow money to take and do this project, and now I need a kitchen that's supposed to be two weeks out, and now it turns out it's 12 weeks out, well, that's two more months of interest I got to pay on this property to try to turn this out, which makes the uncertainty of my ability to complete these projects much more up in the air. Is that what something that you, you think is, is, is a reasonable reason we're not seeing more, more building? I think it has an effect. It's not, I mean, it's in, in, I would say if you were to ask me that question a year and a half ago, I would say absolutely 100%, right? Mm -hmm. It is that the timelines I believe are not quite as bad on materials now. And it could just end up with sure. a, which is probably a, 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 you know, a, a, a 
like a, what do they call it, a trailing factor, right? From mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, from the, you know, that you had so much building and it was impossible to find anything and everything was taking months longer than it was supposed to take. Now it's down to just a few items, you know, you have concrete tiles, they're having trouble anywhere, in, anywhere in the, in the world, pretty much. Well, not in the world, but in the U.S. to get concrete roof tiles trusses and some of the some of those items are, are longer lead time but i think the other major difficulties that we were having a year and a half ago have started to taper out um sure. you know i think now it's maybe a little bit more towards just value right where people are looking at it and just the cost of everything has gone up so much and i just don't think people have caught up just hasn't caught up right i mean if you were to ask somebody two three years ago what they were building homes for they could have told you some number that was under 200 a square right? Mm -hmm. That just doesn't exist anymore. Now you're talking right. 250, 300 a square. And, and, you know, with there's, I, I just hasn't, I don't, I just don't believe it's caught up yet, yet to the point that people are looking at it going, okay, well, that's just how much it takes to build a house nowadays. I, right. just, I don't believe the lead times are an issue anymore. Um, probably because of the slowdown in general construction anyway, right? Right. Well, I mean, I, and, and there's kind of those two things going on at the same time. While now, lead times are starting to be a little bit more consistent. The cost to borrow money has become more expensive. So it's kind of those two factors kind of almost working against each other to still make it hard for builders to come in there and really step in and in a meaningful way, supplement the inventory that that is, is still in an undersupply state. I mean, we've seen inventory start to creep up again. The, uh, the, the, the supply is no longer, a, you know, what we had a couple of months ago, which was like a 15 second supply of real estate. Uh, right. You know, stuff was just turning over as fast as it was hitting the market. Well, now we're getting up into a two, three month supply of inventory. We're starting to get back to a more stable market. And so you would figure, considering there's still more buyers than there are homes, that that you'd see more construction because single family seems to be where this appetite is. We're, we're seeing some condos built. Um, we're definitely seeing apartment complexes be built. But once again, those single family homes not not seeming to get done. and and whether that's a factor of of just the things that we've talked about, you know, at, at what point did the developers get incentivized to start really banging this out to supplement what what we know is an undersupply situation? And I, I'm 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 thinking it's got to be when there's a little bit more certainty in the market and maybe where the cost of money is maybe not so expensive, or prices go up enough where even with the higher cost of money they can afford to do it. Um, I don't well, know. Are we, talking, are we talking? You know, are we talking? Larger developers or yes. smaller single family kind of, you know, larger, guys. larger developers. I'm talking about why, why isn't, why isn't Lennar at capacity? Why, why aren't these big developers? Lennar is still building some stuff, but nowhere near capacity. Well, didn't well, Lennar just did a sell-off, didn't they? Didn't Lennar just say, hey, you know what? We're worried about the market and they just drop prices on a ton of their inventory to try and reduce inventory. There's, there's a lot of that going on. And there's also a lot of um, of units being converted to rentals that are going on. Even single family home, these developers are turning them into rentals. But at the same time, the same statistics are showing we have a 10 year backlog of insufficient construction. So basically right. 10 years of building we need to take and make up for because we haven't been building enough units because of all the fun stuff that happened in 2008 and beyond that recovery from that market has really had the developers sitting on their hands for a long time. And that so, fear factor, that fear factor, I think, still is a is a big, is a is a is a big mitigating factor right now, right? Just that that fear factor of all this stuff that happened in two thousand eight, everyone just getting so beat up, and it's like weird to talk about something that happened, you know, thirteen years ago or whatever, you know, fourteen years ago now. But do you have a situation in the market right now where you've got really high inflation, right? Mm -hmm. um, you've got really high interest rates, and we're going to try and drop inflation. So you have an economy that everyone's everyone's saying is going to be in a big slowdown. We've seen some, but it hasn't been the big dive that they're saying that we're going to see. But there's still everyone is worried that it's about to fall off a cliff, mm -hmm. right? So in in you know in line with that, they say, oh well, these super high interest rates, you know, then uh, you know the your resale market, your your sales market for the houses has got to drop too. It, it has to go in the tank. Now, I'm not saying I'm not that's not what I'm saying, but that that's the fear that's out that's there. The, that's the, that's the thinking by those that are, are are making that case. Yeah. So so if so that so you have so there's instability. There's you know, do I am I going to go go ahead and build this, you know, 450 unit community, not knowing whether or not the bottom's gonna fall out tomorrow. Now, right. 
personally, I don't think the bottom's going to fall out of residential <laughs> at least. Um, you know, I just don't see it happening. But it's the the fear factor is absolutely there because I, every one of these guys, every one of these developers, yeah. got caught with their hand in the cookie jar circa two thousand eight when all lending stopped, and now all of a sudden they were sitting there holding all this inventory they were trying to take and build to meet the demand that existed at the time. No, that's actually a really good point um, because almost all of these developers have been in the business long enough to remember. The big developers have definitely been in the business long enough to remember that whole trying to take and keep up with the demand that we had coming through the 2000s of just more and more buyers looking to buy more and more, and more stuff. And then overnight, the demand going away when the bank stopped lending. So it was a game of musical chairs where, you know, there's 50 people playing. There's only one chair left at the end kind of thing. 49 of them are sitting there twisting in the wind and they, they don't want to take and repeat that. So, yeah, that fear factor is probably a really good, a really good point to look at. Um, one of the interesting things I find is that that doesn't jibe with the history of how real estate's performed when there is inflation. Real estate tends to outperform the inflation and tends to outappreciate the inflation. So it seems like they're almost expecting an event different than what history would lead us to think would happen. And, and I've heard a few good things, that is a good air quotes inserted. I've heard a few good reasons maybe to think things are different. Um, one is the tremendous liquidity that was created by the printing of money and dropping this in and, and having at the same time, these very low interest rates had people just spending their money all over the place into investments and creating these artificial bubbles. Um, we've seen that kind of get busted out with crypto, which probably needed to happen at some point because there was just so much speculative buying. Um, the stock market also is kind of starting to see, has seen a major pullback from some of the highs. Uh, and you got to figure some of the money that was, crea was created and distributed was allocated to investment in these things. Um, you can't think that real estate is, is separate and distinct from that, that real estate had to be uh, invested in heavily as well. But the difference seems to be that the very low interest rates that existed when this was going on has helped to create the lack of inventory that there is because people that got in at two and a half and three percent aren't going to sell their house anytime soon if they're going to have to go rebuy at seven, eight, nine, ten, and above. Sure. And you, and you also have to look at the investor side of that when it comes to inventory, right? So, I mean, if you were just, you know, if you're an investor buying a house today, and you want to go buy a house at 7% interest or 8% interest or whatever you're going to pay as your investor interest rate, the, the rents don't cut it anymore, right? You can't get enough money in your rents to cover, to cover your expenses there. It just doesn't make sense at this, at, a, at that interest rate for most market, market price like houses. It just doesn't, you know, wind it back to 3%, you buy that same house for the same price with the same, you know, rental rates, which, you know, because the rents haven't like they've gone up, but it hasn't been, you know, it's, it's not they haven't doubled the way interest rates have. Right. Um, so I think that there was, you know, you have a lot of single family that was bought by real estate investors. And, you know, all the all the all the funds that were buying, you know, buying, buying real estate, BlackRock or whatever that are. Uh, and they're not. Why, why would they release? Why would they let go of any of their prop, any of their assets right now? Rental Absolutely. rates are as high as, as high as they are. Um, you're you know, the the. You know, for them to buy new, the interest rates, the, the cost of money is so high for them to buy new. So why not just sit on it and allow the appreciation, take your rentals until until the cost of money goes down and then maybe they can rotate it or whatever they do with their inventory. So. Right. And that that would seem to make sense. They, they position themselves very well. The question is whether or not positioning yourself in this market today still makes sense. And, and that's very much a, the, the, the simple answer to that question is, will real estate behave the way it typically does when there's inflation, which is that you have disproportional rent growth and disproportional appreciation to a standard market? I mean, the problem really is that we've had baked into the cake since the mid 80s, this idea of 3% real estate appreciation and 3% rent growth that we've seen, well, for the last 30 plus years. And so it's been going on that way so long that we think that almost, at least for most of us that aren't you know, old enough to have been around then, that that's always how it's been. But as it turns out before that, those numbers were not three. <laughs> we're along for, for quite more than a decade. Those numbers were closer to 9% appreciation and 9% rent growth. Um, and so if, if that's what had happened in the past, the last time real estate was exposed, to this kind of inflation, and we haven't seen a lot of inflation in the last 30 years, you would think that uh, the outlook that the Black Rocks of the world have taken 
to take and lengthen their position in real estate, shorten their position in cash, lengthen their position in real estate. Well, I mean, if we're looking at all the players in the space, are, are you going to go to stocks right now? I mean, does, it, does the outlook for stocks look that good? We had Target this morning missed their, missed their numbers significantly. Retail sales getting crushed. Um, it, it's, it would look like if we are headed to this recession that has been prognosticated, that has been predicted so heavily um, by a lot of sources. And, you know, you, talking heads, they all, all have to have something to say, and you just got to be bad news, right? But it would seem like the the recipe exists for there to be a major recession, then that would clearly indicate that something like stocks whose revenue whose whose valuation is based upon their revenues, well, revenues are <clears> going to <throat> get hurt when there's when there's a, a recession. So the earnings won't those earning numbers will be poor. Theoretically, that'll be reflected in the share price. Um, so the outlook for the stock market doing particularly well isn't all that great. Bonds, you know. I'm still not buying a 4% interest rate for the next 10 years. I'll st I could still do better in my real estate. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not selling real estate. <laughs> so, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I, literally, I'm with you. We, we partner on a bunch of properties that we own together. Um, and so, you know, what is the out crypto? I mean, what's the, where is, where does the money go? I, I'm sitting here. I got money. What do I do with it? And, and honestly, this is the question I get asked all the time by people, especially real estate agents that have made a little bit of money. They're like, oh, okay, I have money. What do I do with it? <laughs> and it's it's really like, oh, okay, what do you pick? And and based upon that and the outlook, I still think that real estate, like, like you said, I'm not selling my real estate. I, I think real estate is, is the best safe haven, especially historically based upon how it's performed. What do you think? I mean, I agree that if, for, if you're thinking of value, Right. It's definitely the best safe haven. I mean, for, for large quantities of money. Right. I mean, my, the thing for me right now that I, that like is as an investor, if you're, if you're a leveraged investor, um, I don't know how much real estate is going to be because I mean, you know, I, I mean, we, we've looked at it, right. If you look at like what you're getting, you know, how much you're paying for property and how much it costs for leverage on that property and what you can get as a return on that property uh, as a rental. I don't, I don't think the money is there right now. Um, are, are they still a good store of value? Absolutely. And I mean, honest, even if you're, even if you're not really making a whole lot of money, you're just breaking even because values are going to go up as inflation, you know, with inflation, I don't think you're going to see, you know, the, what people are talking about. I still think that there's value in real estate. I still think the values are going to go up. Um, so I believe that you're still making money, but for a lot of people, um, when you're looking in that sort of that leveraged investing into real estate, I'm going to put $50,000 into a $300,000 property yeah. and then rent it out, et cetera. The money, the, the, the numbers just don't make sense right now because the rates are so high. Um, right. But it, so the, it, the general discipline almost has to, the, 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 the 30 year math that you used to do for the last 30 years of, of how much leverage you could take on a real estate investment and have it make sense has to change. The LTV has to change. Now you're, you're no longer leveraging at 75% LTV and having it make sense. You might have to be at 50% LTV. And so you're going to need more cash to get into the same investment, if you will, to have it be positive cash flow. I think it's kind of what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, at least, at least, at least in our market and the markets that I'm looking at and what I see, there's probably still markets out there that you can buy property that, you know, where you, even with the current rates that they have right now, you can still, you know, get some sort of a decent return. But I don't think that, uh, at least where we are right now, it's the, it's, it's a much more difficult avenue to get into when you're, de when you're using leverage. Um, Good stuff. Makes sense. No, I I, I agree. So let, let's take a like take a little step away from the market, which is a a, a a tangent that you and I I know could hang out in for quite a while. Sure. Um, and, and let's talk specific construction stuff. Maybe let's get into the weeds just a little bit to help our our agents out there and our people that are thinking about taking and getting some work done. Um, most common things, most common renovations that you see that homes homes need that people are asking for right now. What would those be? You know, it would, depending on what people are looking to do, like what stage they are, like if you say, you know, when I, I guess when I, when I'm saying that is, you know, there's renovations because you need to renovate because you have a hole in your roof. Right. Um, right. And, and, you know, like, you know, you would say your, your upkeep renovations. Um, and then repairs there's, you're talking about almost. 
Yeah, I mean, even a new roof is still a repair, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's home upkeep, right? So as a realtor, you know, you're not real. That's not what you're looking at. You're because people aren't, you know, most people aren't buying a house and saying, hey, you know what? Let me buy this house and then redo the roof, right? That doesn't yeah. ever happen. If someone comes to me after having just purchased a home, then there's, it's always a kitchen. Right. It's a kitchen. It's in, in, in sometimes a bathroom, but I would say it's almost always a kitchen. People are yeah. always getting in there going, hey, I need to redo the kitchen. I need to open it up. I need to make some space. I need to make it make the kitchen mine. That's I, I would say the number one thing that people do when they get into a home is, is let me make the kitchen mine. Absolutely. And so what, what are the big things that people have to look out for, be aware of that they need to know when it comes to kitchens? Because I know kits, the kitchens can be a little bit of a. Uh, I don't say a black hole, but they they could they there's kitchens and there's kitchen remodels and and the differences are are, uh, are significant. There there are, are definitely pitfalls that one can run into. So what are some of the big things to watch out for? You know what gets people more often than not, they don't think about when they're getting into kitchens is floors, right? Because mm-hmm. everyone goes in the kitchen, they're like, you know what? I, they buy a house and they're like, okay, you know what we, we we could do? We could open up this wall. And then oh, it opens the kitchen up and then we can see the rest. And then we can have this big open space and it's going to be beautiful, so on and so forth. And, you know, new kitchen costs $20,000. We'll be fine. Right. But then, you know, I come take out the there wall out <laughs> and I'm like, well, but if you take that wall out and if you change the floor plan, every kitchen, all this tile is bad. You're not bad, but you have holes here because it's there's usually it's usually it's always cut around it, cut around the yep. walls, whatever. Um, and they never have the tile because they're buying the house and they don't think to go ask the person, hey, do you have six or seven additional boxes of tile or anything like that? Um, or the person doesn't have it because the tile's been there for 20 years. And then, then they end up spending another twenty thousand to do the to do their floors because they have to redo the entire you know floor of the house or first floor or whatever in order for it to make it work wherever the reasonable place to take and make the cut with the new floor would be yeah so yeah. that that is that is a good one and I, I know that the electrical side of things also can be when the city gets involved and with permitting uh your kitchen that that can also be a little bit of a uh a problem so yeah uh, can, can you can you speak to that some so in 2017, uh, the the new co- the code that came out required a, a change to the electrical code. That I don't want to get too far into the weeds, and I know you could because you know quite a bit a lot about electrical as well. But the, there's just some code that came out regarding sharing a neutral um, and having what's called an arc fault breaker, which a lot of uh, which no kitchens have. Right. You know, no, no one did that because it just didn't exist, and, and somebody you know made this new fancy widget and said, hey, you know make me a bunch of money. And the government said, yeah, I'll make you a bunch of money. And so that's what they're doing. Right. Um, so when you get into a new kitchen and anytime you're doing a new circuit and anytime you're messing with electrical, any place you have to go ahead and add new arc fault breakers, at least, you know, at least we'll work from, right. There may be some areas of the country where it's NEC it's, it's national electric code. I mean, it's, is it national? So the NEC is actually the one that changed it. Gotcha. Okay. Well, see, there you go. Um, But uh, so uh, so in you know so you're touching the kitchen and which means that they say okay well you're doing the electrical so you either got to do it do all no so then you go to the panel and the panel only has two two open spaces well the code says hey you need to have two separate circuits for for small appliances a separate circuit for the microwave a separate circuit for the refrigerator um, you know and all of a sudden garbage like, disposal and the whole yeah. So, so then, so now it's, now you're adding $5,000 to your kitchen cost because you have to then go ahead and do a brand new panel for the house. Those little things can really like, you know, uh, you know, shock. Yeah. And I mean, and the, the worst part of that always in my mind is, you know, I want this beautiful kitchen to come in and, and, and have my house look beautiful. I don't want a brand new electrical panel. Like nobody gets a brand new electrical panel in their house that says, bring their friends over, come check out my new panel. <laughs> like it. I don't want it. <laughs> I, I don't want it. I don't. The house has had the same panel for sixty years. Why do I need a new panel? Um, it's it's a thing, and I mean, I I know especially with the condos, it can get so messy because now the lines coming in to the panel, you have to change the panel. Well, the panel is like this big. Well, the new panel is like four times the size, and now the wires don't reach where they need to in the panel to connect the panel. So now you have to take and pull new lines all the way from the electric room and all the stuff that that can entail, and and so is. Is it is a permit required to do a new kitchen? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, I mean and it's not just one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's it's building plumbing electrical. I mean, look, a lot of people do them without permits. 
you know, and I'm not going to say I've never done a kitchen without permit. If any contractor tells you they've never done a kitchen without a permit, they are lying. But, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you're looking say, hey, what is, what's, what's by, by law, what are you supposed to do? Um, the second you take that countertop off, you're supposed to pull a permit because you're, 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 you're affecting the plumbing, you're affecting how it's connected, how everything's connected. So you gotta pull a plumbing permit. And then they're also gonna assume, well, since you're pulling the countertop off, then you're messing with the, with the receptacles behind it, which means you need to pull an electrical permit. And you can say, well, wait a second, I got a four inch back spot. I'm not touching that stuff. I don't care. Yep. <laughs> the city won't care. That, that's a very technical term the city uses when they're gonna nail you no matter what. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's a thing. And, and that's actually any room in the house that you touch any of the electrical in anymore now. You have to take and make all those circuits, I think, retrofitted to, to arc fault uh, circuit breakers going going forward, right? You do. I mean, if you if you're gonna, if you open up a receptacle, you, you have to take it over to arc fault, right? You have to bring it up to current code. And if you know, look, see, arc fault sucks. I'm not going to, I'm not, arc fault sucks. It's, it's not, there's nothing, GFI is just fine. Arc fault is just like, you know, you know, one more, you know, uh, notch on the nanny society right um the but the the idea of having to do that i mean look we don't you know just you know we go into houses sometimes we have a house right now that went into we open up and we you know open up the walls and there's there's the mess that you can find back there um is pretty amazing it's pretty amazing what you can see when you go in there and open up the walls behind some of these places. And the, how do these people do that? I mean, I've seen I, I've seen electrical outlets ran with speaker wire. I, I it's you know just a lamp lamp cord like like literal lamp cord in the walls. I mean, you can see so many things. So so the idea of having to bring stuff up to code is actually not that bad of an idea. It's just there's such a pain in the butt about it. You know, that just doesn't, sometimes it's like, this just doesn't make sense. Okay. I understand I need to bring it up to code, but look, the difference between this thing that's good for 2017 and this thing that's good to, for 2020 is really nothing. Okay. I can understand if we were, be, we we're getting into a building that's built on 1983 code. All right. Yeah. You know what? Let, let, let's, let's make the change. But sometimes it's, you know, it, instead of the, it, 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 it's incremental. And it in yeah. you know, major and that, and, but I mean, in general, you know, how do you, right? what are you going to do? No. And, and the, the part that's really tough about this is simultaneously out of one side of, of every politician's mouth is coming out, out about the, the affordability crisis of homes. And at the same time, all these things that they're doing make the very homes that they need us to build on the developer, on the contractor side, more expensive to build. So they want cheaper homes, but everything they're doing is making the exact same home more expensive. And so it's kind of running at cross purposes with each other. And it it, it is problematic uh, from yeah. that standpoint. I try something. I, I, I get, you know, I'm always doing my best when I talk to people to try and like, you know, people come in and they want to do stuff and they have a budget. And I'm like, okay, well, let me see if I, I, I want to help. You know, it's detrimental to me sometimes because, you know, I'm trying to make things work for people, but it's, you know, the, with the amount of work that needs to go into doing some of the items that are required now in order to build homes or in order to do additions or whatever else, it's just the, 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 the expenses just, they keep ticking up and up and up and up and up and there's not much you can do about it. So, I mean, and, and one of the big ones I know as far as time has been such a problem as far as how long it takes to get things done, not on the construction. I mean, the construction material thing has definitely been its own issue, but the backlog on the architect and engineering side, I know has been a serious issue. And also the backlog with the cities of getting these uh, plans looked at and getting them approved, I know has been a huge issue. It has, yeah. That's another thing I was gonna mention earlier when you were talking about people buying homes, you know, buying homes to build, you know, because, or, or buying, you know, buying land to build. Not developers, but like individuals saying, hey, I bought this lot of land, let me hire you a contractor and have him come out here and, and and build my house for me. I had somebody call me about that the other day and they're like, you know, what do you think my timeline is? And I told them, you need to plan. What, what's, I said, what stage are you at? And he said, well, I've just decided this is something that I want to do. I don't know if I'm going to do this or if I'm going to buy a house. And I said, so you haven't found property yet? No, I haven't. I said, look, you need to think that, are you okay with not being in your house until two years from today, right? Because that's what you're looking at. Finding your house or finding your land, getting that land prepped, Getting and getting into an architect and get you know and you know and, and getting somebody contract us because architects and engineers are so behind right now um, because of you know due to 
you know, multiple factors, especially in our area, because you have the, you know, with all the stuff with the condos and, and you know, which put all the engineers behind. And, you know, yep. Uh, but then getting into the city, et cetera, I mean, you're not going to have, if you started today and said, look, this is something that I want to do, and you weren't going with a pre-built plan, you wanted to build, you know, design build from scratch, you're not going to be, you're not going to break ground for eight, nine, 10 months. It's just not going to happen. So and then that's a, that's a best case. Then that's a best case scenario. Correct. Yeah. I mean, we, we have definitely seen plans tied up for a year in a city to get their absolutely. approval and, and timelines absolutely just not even adhered to like, we'll get back to you when we feel like it. Okay. And, and, and all of that takes in, especially when you consider the idea that some of these people that are building these are borrowing money in order to do it. <laughs> you know, that debt service is running on them. Their carry costs are, are eating them up to some extent. So yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that seems to be pushed for three days. Well, you, Say it again. Like, we have inspections that get pushed for three days on a regular yeah. basis, but like the list comes out and we're number 65. And I'm like, how is this person, this one guy going to get through 65 homes in one? I know he does it. He gets through 20 and then you drop down to 45. And then the next day he gets through another 20 and then you drop down to 25 and you hope by day three that he's going to get to you because they're all, you know, it's, you know, uh, and every once in a while, they'll skip a bunch of numbers on the list and, and come surprise and show yeah. up. You weren't there. <laughs> we got to reset. I number 60. You know, why would I be there? You were on number three. How did you go to 65? Right. Yeah. No, it's a thing. And so what that does, once again, you know, it's the little stuff that you don't even think about. But the cost for the contractor to have somebody out there to take and be there for the inspection that they need to be. Now what? You're paying for that. That's getting added to your construction cost, all because the timelines that the city puts out aren't being adhered to. All of these things, every one of these things takes and makes the construction process that much more expensive. And it's real stuff that goes on and it really affects people's bottom lines and the ability to take and get homes built in a meaningful way. So that that definitely does represent an additional problem, I suppose. Um what about other things besides kitchens? What what are the other big things that you're seeing people people look for right now? Well, right now, you know what's you know what I see right now people are doing additions. Honestly, I mean it's yeah you know, it, that's what you know the, the which is a factor of the market, right? You know where you know, either they can't afford the house that they want to get into, um, and so they get into a smaller home and then they're looking to add additional land on there, or they you know, they want to move, but they can't find any place that's going to fit. They want what they want to do for their budget. And so they're like, okay, well, you know what? I got an extra, you know, 1500 square feet a yard or whatever. Let me see if I can add, you know, add 350 square feet. I see more additions right now than I have in the entire time that I've, that I've been in the business. It's, you know, it's very, very common. That so I can't find this. Talking. I can't find the house I want. Let me make this house, the house that I want kind of thing. Right. Yeah, which, you know, I don't know. I, th I think it's, it, it'll be interesting to see for me. Like I, I was actually thinking about that the other day, right? Because I think that you're seeing more additions right now than you've ever seen. I mean, I, I even, I drive down the road and I'm like, oh, there's an addition, there's an addition, there's an addition. It's, which, you know, I don't know if that's one, you know, the, the, where if you're doing a lot of something, you see it all the time, though there's mm -hmm. a name for that concept. I forget what it's called. Um, but uh, I, and I don't know if it's that because we are seeing, seeing so many people call us about them or if it's just, they're out in the market right now. So how is it when, when we see the, the rates start to, to back off a little bit, right? And people start to get less fearful of the market, right? Um, what is this going to do to neighborhoods, right? Where, you know, maybe the neighborhood was traditionally a 3-2 neighborhood. And all of a sudden, there's a bunch of 4-3s um, and bigger homes in that neighborhood that are going to start going on the market because people say, you know what, okay, well, now I want to move because rates are lower and I can go move to this other neighborhood that I want to be in. So now they're putting their house on the market that's bigger than it used to be. And how's that going to affect the values inside of these markets? I mean, I don't know if it's going to be a major factor, but it's just, it was just something that was kind of whittling through my head the other day when I was driving around. Yeah. And that makes sense. I mean, how, how that's going to affect these markets that were all kind of cookie cutter. And now there's the, these outlier homes in these, how, how are you even going to comp it? How are, how are the appraisers going to take and deal with it? How are we going to get the valuations? What are they going to use? They're going to use price per square foot to take and figure out what the, what, what it's worth um, and how the agent's going to handle it. One of the big things I teach agents in classes when it comes to valuations, is you need to know what the average price per square foot is in your market, because anybody that's ever taken a listing in, um, in Hialeah knows you show up there 
and uh, the listing, the, the the tax roll says two bedroom, one bath. You get there at six bedrooms, five baths with an indoor swimming pool. And you're like, well, gee, you know, <laughs> I'm not, my comps aren't prepped for this, right? And none of it added legally. So, you know, what is that, what does that shake out to be? Although now that, that Hialeah has been, has the reoccupancy inspections, I think that that's going to get squeezed out quite a bit. Yeah. Um, so, um, maybe maybe just really kind of rapid fire here a little bit I'm going to toss out some some different things and and maybe your thoughts on, on on what agents should kind of have rolling around in their head as far as you know um things that you see in the market you think are interesting you think are cool you think are things that people should maybe know about when it comes to different parts of the house um maybe newer products or whatever just I'm going to toss them out there and and you tell me what comes to mind when we talk about it I know we're doing a lot in the way of roofs, <laughs> roofing materials right now. What are things that agents should, you know, talking, they're not supposed to be ex experts in any of this stuff, but just stuff they should know about what's going on in the market so that maybe they know more than the average bears, like Yogi, smarter than the average bear. What are some things they should know about roofing right now? Well, first thing they should they should know about roofing is, is, is concrete tile, right? Any, anytime you're looking at a place, um, and concrete and, and the and the roof's got concrete tile and it's older in its lifespan know that they're going to have a mission getting that roof done so if you're looking at, at, a, at a property that has concrete roof tiles and it's an older roof and you're like thinking okay well if that if that roof ends up leaking for some reason because it's an older roof it's it's an eight nine month process and so it's definitely you know it, it takes some time so as an agent you should maybe kind of be i think be educating your client about, hey, you need to look at this and understand that this roof is 20 years old. Insurance companies now, that's another big thing that they, is insurance companies now are canceling people's insurance, right? Mm. They're done with this idea of you having a roof that's 15 years old that has a 10 year lifespan and then you're getting damaged to your house and you're suing them. I get clients call me all the time saying my insurance company told me that if I don't replace my roof, they're dropping me, um, which wasn't as common before um, and it's very common now. So you really want to look at the age of that roof, look at the lifespan, and make sure that you're doing something to, to set your client up for success. Because the inspector comes out there and says, yeah, sure, it's got three years left. And you go ahead and you buy it with three years left. The, a, year, a year later, the insurance company is going to come out and cancel their insurance, right? Because it's too close to the end of the lifespan. They need to renew the roof, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so that's something you that people really want to look out for, I think. Um, and uh, I know you've been doing a lot more with metal roofs. How do you what, how do you feel about them? What do you what do you think about metal roofs? I was just going to go and that's really what I was going to just going to talk about with metal roofs. And I love metal roofs. And the thing you know, metal roof is obviously it's, it's the cheapest and most expensive roof that you can do, right? So and that's what I tell people all the time because lifespan of the roof it's the lowest cost roof that you could possibly do, right? So if you amortize the cost of the roof over the lifespan of the roof because of the longer lifespan, it's cheaper per year. Correct. Um, it may cost, yeah. So it may be twelve hundred a square up front, where a shingle roof is say six hundred a square. Right? So twice as much, just roughly. Yeah, double the cost. Um, you know, roughly. But a shingle roof lasts you, you know, twelve years, maybe fourteen years. Where the metal roof is going to last, probably for the rest of the time that you're in that home, 35, 40 years. I mean, they have fifty year lifespans, right? So to me, I mean, that's, you know, when you see something and that's something, it's a cost factor when you're looking at stuff, people go and say, oh, it's a metal roof. That should add, that should add five, ten thousand dollars to the value of the property over, over a shingle or a tile roof, just because of the, of the lifespan of the roof. It also, and they, they the, the, the insurance companies really like it a lot because it has the highest, um, uh, uh, uplift. Uplift, yeah, thank you. It, it, it blows the uplift away for uh, for shingle and, and tile. That they're not even close. I don't have the exact numbers on me, but they're not even close. It's like double the uplift. It's out of control. So, gotcha. And so, uh, the one thing that I always thought of originally when I heard about metal roofs before I was a contractor or anything like that um, was I would think about like the metal roofs on, on mobile homes. And you know, when it rains, it sounds like you know somebody's taking pot shots at the house with a BB gun. Ting, 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 ting. There's there there's there's specific things with metal roofs to keep that from being the case, right? You're not getting all that sound transfer, are you? No, you don't. Not at all. I mean, it's the, the material is different now, and it's 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 got it's you know, it's got it's got two layers up there. So it's I mean, I've 
been in plenty of people that has house of metal roofs. I've done metal roofs. I've seen what they sound like afterwards. Um, and with something that you do in a modern modern day, I mean, it's it's just not even a factor. Anymore. So, I mean, there's actually an insulation layer that they, they make you put in. There's an inspection for that too, isn't there? Correct, yeah. So you have to you do it very similar to the way you do a tile roof where you actually have you have to do have two layers in there and there's a thing called um I forget the name of it right now because I'm drawing a blank. Um but there is a second material that you that you need to put in there which works as an insulating layer and soundproofing layer and you can't hear it. It's good stuff. All right. So um that's one thing. Uh windows. Anything in particular with windows that, that agents should be aware of as maybe as a good talking point of things for their customer, especially you know, maybe as regards uh, keeping a house cool or energy efficiency or any of those sorts of things? I mean, obviously they need to, you know, they should be looking at whether or not they have impact windows or not. I mean, that's very simple, right? I mean, but I think every agent should know that right away. They walk in, they say, okay, well, yeah, this does, this does, or this doesn't. So there's that safety factor involved in it. Um, but the, the, um, the, the reduction in, in noise and the reduction in in energy bills uh, from windows is a big deal. Noise is actually the biggest one that they, that, that people don't think about, right? That's the one that when that when you're getting into with it, you know, because everyone kind of knows, oh, you know, the energy reduction and it's to stay from hurricanes and so on and so forth. But the big thing that people don't think about when they're looking at a house that's got impact windows versus a house that doesn't is noise reduction. Yep. It is night and day. You know, even when you're thought, you know, if, if obviously if you go with like the the, the, the full Monty the, with, you know, the, the vinyl and insulated glass and everything, you know, everything associated with it, then it's, the, it's like a safe when it comes to noise reduction. But even the standard aluminum frame, you know, impact glass is just a complete difference. Um, so, you know, versus somebody saying, oh, well, I'm safe because I have my windows and I have my accordion shutters. Yeah, that's fine. But you don't get all the other benefits as well. And there really are a lot of alternate benefits such as the the energy production and energy energy reduction and the noise production i, I think one of the interesting things that i i saw was and it was a surprise to me when i was first learning about this is the security benefits of impact glass i remember watching a video of, of a guy trying to break in with like a hammer into a house that had impact glass and he's sitting there beating on the glass and the glass is is breaking but it's not caving in it's, 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 it's withstanding this, this beating that it's taken. And before the guy got in, the cops wound up showing up the house. Cause it was, he was trying to get at somebody in the house. It was a YouTube video I had seen on it. So that's another, I think, underestimated factor in, uh, in, in what the impact glass gives you. Is that I know, I agree. People and people, I've had people tell me they're like, "Oh, I don't want glass in my front door." I'm like, but wait, I can see your front door right here, and I could break this frame with a bat. You know, <laughs> it's not, it's not that tough. <laughs> like, you're not gonna. It's, it's way safer than than most things out there. So. Absolutely, it, it really is a, an amazing material that they that they use in those impact glass that, that that makes up that impact glass. The last one I'll hit you with is floors. I, I know there's some new flooring materials that come out. There's been more stuff with vinyl and and all sorts of stuff. What are you seeing in flooring materials? What, what are some things that you know agents should kind of again have their head wrapped around as far as you know cost and options and, and things like that for people. I mean, vinyl is beautiful. Um, and I, I put more vinyl, I, I love putting vinyl in right now just because it really has a good look. It lasts forever. The warranties on it are just phenomenal. Um, but if I was to say what an agency needs to look out for, I mean, they need to, I mean, especially, I mean, maybe not, maybe not as bad now, um, but you know, when you're dealing with, with flip houses, things like that, they really need to be able to pay attention to, you know, whether or not you have flooring on top of other flooring. Um, you know, how to look for that, you know, go walking in when you walk into a, when you walk from room to room and you see like a little one inch difference and things like that. Um, because those are, those are those little differences when someone goes to do some work on their home can make a very big difference. Um, but you know, on the, on another aspect of it, if you're saying, okay, well, I'm an Asian, I'm getting into a home, what, you know, or I'm not, I'm trying to sell somebody a home, look at the cost of putting in vinyl floors. Right. Somebody goes in there, they don't like the flooring, it, but it's, you know, it, it, the tile is nice, but it's just dated. It's actually not a problem to do flooring over flooring, as long as it's done properly and you don't have some sort of weird kind of split level things around the house. So it's not a problem. If someone has very good tile that's strong and you can tell you walk around a tile, you can tell if it's strong. If you walk and you feel like it just, it's, it's just a feel thing, right? You can tell you bang on a little bit. If it feels solid, it's not a problem to go ahead and just run new vinyl all over that, all throughout the entire house and give it a great look. You can do that for like, 
four or five dollars a square foot you know versus putting a new tile which may cost you 11 or 12. so someone comes in and says oh it's going to be twenty thousand dollars for the new floors well they can do it for vinyl it's going to cost them nine or ten right and it's not as invasive and you can do it in like three or four days so it can be a a point and a way to sell a home to somebody on out like the floors so, so yeah but, you know get a get a credit get a get a credit from the seller for new floors ten thousand dollars and put new vinyl in there and then have it done the day before you move in and it'll look gorgeous because it looks it really does look very nice it's not your old kind of you know it's not what you would expect to think when you think of vinyl from from 10 years ago it looks very very high end and and i i know as you say that i can see behind you the vinyl floor that you're currently sitting on right now um so it's one of those things that what does the contractor actually use in their office? <laughs> you're, 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 you're on vinyl floors right now. I think the other piece of this that um, for those agents that are working with investors is while it's more expensive than the laminate floors are to put in, uh, the material is, is usually about twice as much. The durability factor for your investor customers that have rental properties of vinyl versus laminate is just night and day they look similar they're a similar looking product as far as the thickness of the material and things like that and the way that they connect to each other but the durability factor is significantly better for those that vinyl product correct i can't understand why anyone would even put in the low cost laminate products i don't i honestly like the 69 cent square foot laminate product that you can go buy buy and, and put i just can't it, for the cost difference to go up to spend you know a dollar twenty-five, a dollar thirty on a lower end vinyl. I mean, we're not talking luxury vinyl plank that will run you like three bucks a square foot, but the, some of the stuff that's like a dollar thirty, a dollar forty-five versus that, you know, super cheap laminate product, it's just it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You're gonna have to redo the laminate in six years at the most. The second thing yeah, yeah. is a cup of water on it. You got 20 boards to take up. Um, the only time to me that someone should use vinyl is if they're using like one of the really high-end glossy vinyls that they want to put in like a study or something. You mean laminate? Hmm? You mean laminate? That's what I meant to say. You know what I meant to say. Yeah. <laughs> I knew what you meant to say. Maybe. Yeah. So, right, so the only time someone should use laminate as far as it is, is really if they're, if they're using that really high-end laminate that they're going to put in a room specifically for the look of it but to do an entire house an entire condo an entire anything and laminate floors even the higher end stuff i just don't think it makes sense anymore the vinyl product is just too good and it lasts too long and it's too durable um it just doesn't make any sense yeah no, i mean it, it, it's durability factor is, is getting up in that tile sort of range i mean one of the best it's expensive but as a, as a landlord putting tile in you know you, you know you're good for if you put in decent tile you know you're good for like ever well yeah. The, the 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 vinyl is getting up into that neck of the woods. Nothing is going to be quite as as durable as good as a good tile floor. But you know now you're getting up in that neck of the woods at half or less than of the for the cost to do the exact same thing. Sure, but you don't got to steam clean your grout on vinyl every five years to to stop it from looking like a, a black yeah. and moldy mildew mess. Right? Absolutely no. I mean there there's just the 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 benefits far outweigh. The difference in cost from that 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 cheap vinyl that's got to be or that cheap laminate that's got to be tossed away. No, so I 100 agree. Well, I don't want to take any more of your time, Cody. I, I want to thank you so much for making the time for coming and hanging out with us here, and uh, and maybe giving agents just uh, a little bit more to take and make them seem like a little bit more of an expert when their customer talks to them. So thank you for your time, buddy.